Welcome to the Spring 2021 meeting of the Derbyshire Groundsmen's Association. This month we have an update from Mick Glenn of the Cricket Foundation, followed by Dave Fern from the County League, who takes us through rule changes and new clubs this season. Mike Applin of Larch Groundworks gives us an introduction to the services his company offers, and finally we hear from Steve Hollis who gives us a guide to preparing your ground for the coming season. I'll try and get we'll try and get it finished in an hour. Mick, off you go. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks, Keith, and welcome everybody. Uh, just two or three little things to mention. Uh, first thing, clubs might remember I did send out some time ago, or the DCF did a survey on what sort of courses people wanted. Uh, this was all around groundsmen, coaches, everything. And we had about 20 groundsmen that are interested in doing an online level one groundsman course through the grounds management association so i'm going to be sending a link through through to the people that expressed an interest in doing that um keith what i'll also do i'll send it to you the same email and ask you to forward it on to the clubs in case and contacts in case there's anyone else in the clubs it didn't seem i think it's about 25 quid didn't seem a lot of, you know a lot of money never before heard on cricket we are I think if somebody can turn the uh, TV off, that would be helpful. Um, so, so that was number one. The second thing, just want quickly to mention, quite a few clubs have had the return to Cricket Grant. Um, the ECB put in, added in, due to concern about ground maintenance. So there were concerned that clubs might cut down on ground maintenance because they were short of cash. Now, the, the, the project's got about a month to run. So if your club if your club hasn't accessed that grant as yet, and as a groundsman you've been told, you know, things have got to be cut back or whatever, then please get somebody from the club to get in touch with me. You know, we might be able to help through that scheme if you've got a if you've got a short a current shortfall. And then the last thing that I just want to mention, we've sent out a uh, a survey from the DCF around ground and facility improvements. So I've so far had about 40 clubs get back. I will be sending out a reminder. The interesting thing about this is that just recently, I don't know if it's just purely by accident, but we've had quite a lot of contact with local authorities where there's, where they've building houses and they are looking there's sometimes a little bit of money available. We've managed to extract a little bit of money for a couple of clubs in the area. So it's very useful to have information on what the clubs are doing. And it's something I do every year or year and a half. So it's not something I don't do. But please make sure that if you're doing anything on your ground or adding any pitches or planning anything of a, a reasonable size, mm -hmm. that it's included in what your club returns to me. And I think that's it, Keith, unless there are anybody's got any specific questions. Uh, not that I can answer any questions relating to grounds. But... Oh, that's it. Thank you, Mick. Um, Dave Fern, over to you. Oh, yeah, good evening. Um, where do we start? Uh, the Royal Division meeting passed. I don't know if everybody's aware of what happened at the Royal Division meeting. It was held by Zoom for the first time ever. Um, went, I think, as well as anything could do with 100 and odd people on the call, uh, giving people the chance to air their views. The big um, items were that um, win-lose cricket in divisions one to six of the county league were approved. Um, in round figures, 120 votes to 90. Uh, division one would mirror the Premier Division in that it will have Duckworth Lewis um, to sort out the result in the case of bad weather. Uh, divisions two to six um, will revert to the old system of abandoned matches and points accordingly, while divisions seven, eight, and nine stay as win, lose, draw cricket, which um, broadly speaking, the proposal that was put forward mirrored the work that Mick and his team at DCF had done with their survey of players 
uh, last season and also that of the captain's survey that uh, the league undertook. There'll be a restriction on bowlers um, to ensure that um, everyone gets a chance really to play in a 50 over game it will be 12 overs per bowler in a 45 over game it'll be 10 overs and in a 40 overs 9 start times um, will continue as they would have done last year um, before COVID so it'll be the same as the 2019 season uh, the feeling was that a lot of people still have to work on Saturday mornings unfortunately um, and the COVID situation has actually increased the um, availability issues with people having lots of other demands on their time, particularly family people. Um, teams, a hot topic of debate, and uh, despite our best efforts, and that we've got a resolution that really comes down to, as it's always been in the league, that teams have the option whether or not to do duties, providing they give due notification. But of course, one of the things we may suffer, Keith and everybody, in the um, new COVID era, is that catering may be ruled out. Um, at the ECB meeting last week, we were told that the ECB would react very quickly to um, the government's announcements. So I'm waiting eagerly for the um, Club and League Bulletin to come from them. They, um, I suppose, Wednesday evening after an announcement on Tuesday, uh, Monday afternoon, uh, by ECB standards, is still pretty quick. Uh, so fingers crossed it'll come tomorrow. Um, you don't, you don't um, think we'll wait until Friday, Dave, because that's when they normally send out their weekly bulletin, isn't it? Well, it could well be, but I live in hope. I, I'm also waiting for another uh, answer that was promised at the um, early part of the week about player registrations and managed migration. And that hasn't come either yet. So um, the only other uh, sort of matter of concern was about the um, ground size issue. If you remember the, the um, County League and the Premier League, or well, the two together now, operate with um, a criteria of 50-yard boundaries with a 35% exception. Uh, exemption to that rule uh, and it was put forward by two clubs and it got closer than I've ever known it um, to be to actually reduce the boundary size didn't get carried but I'm sure it will come back in the future and it, it is worth thinking about that while a lot of clubs have been able to spend a lot of money and develop all sorts of uh, features um, there are clubs within our league who can't expand one because the A6 runs along one boundary, um, others because they're surrounded by houses. Um, not an easy situation, so I'm sure it'll be something that comes back to be discussed in the future. That really are the key things from the rules division, Keith. The look of the league for the new season, um, we all feared, I think, when COVID struck that we would have teams and clubs struggling for players and going out, some going out of business. I'm delighted to say it was totally the opposite, with a lot of clubs finding that because there were no holidays, no overseas holidays, no great trips, a lot more people were available. By my reckoning, we, we lost three teams last year. Stainsby, uh, Quarndon have dropped a team, but they're looking to put a team into the new um, Sunday Development League. Uh, which suits their purpose, I think, and will do a lot of other clubs, and Shipley Hall Thirds. But on the plus side, we gained nine clubs. Uh, Bakewell, who have joined us for the first time, have come in and they'll be playing in Division 7. Chesterfield Thirds uh, switched from the Yorkshire and Derbyshire League to play in our league again. Cutthorpe were put in a fifth team this year. Darley Abbey are running a fourth team, as are Sorley and Long Eaton Park, South Wingfield and Lullington have all put fourth teams in. Holmesfield are running a second team. Belper Amateurs are fielding a third team, and they'll be sharing with Cromford <coughs> Meadows. Uh, and Holmesfield, again, another team coming in. The, the difficulties we've had 
were first Rolls Royce were made homeless. Um, so they had three teams with no ground. And we felt due to bound that we should look after them. We couldn't just say, well, you've got no ground, you can't play cricket, because that's 33 people every week not playing, and also the knock-on to their opponents. Um, Aiden did a lot of groundwork with them and got them a home for their first team at Castle Donington, um, and they are looking to work with Castle Donington uh, to take in equipment there to... Um, boost the the ground rating, as it were. Their second team is playing at Snellsmore Lane, sharing this year with Mickleover. Uh, but my understanding is that they've now formed an agreement with the uh, body that runs the uh, the facility at Snellsmore Lane, Chelliston, to make it their permanent base for two teams for next year. And as a result, they'll be known as Chelliston, not Rolls-Royce. Mickleover obviously will lose the use of that ground, but I know that Mick um, is, is looking into that and Aidan is looking into it, and I'm sure there can be a solution found. I don't know what that was. Um, we, we've got other four, four other or three other teams that are ho homeless for this season: Derby Kong's thirds, uh, Ticknell thirds, and the Woodville ground. Uh, sadly, has not really come up to scratch. You could probably get the ground playable, but there are no facilities of worth there. Uh, and Tutbury thirds are not playing at Rangemore because the. Um, Arrangement with Dunstall has ended because Dunstall are now sharing Barton's ground. And their third team will play at um, Barton together with most of their junior sides. All of us, as a result of not being able to play at Barton, will now play at Armitage, which is a bit out of our patch, but at least they made a lot of effort and a lot of progress to, to secure a ground on which to play. We've got interest from another South Asian side. Um, there were Southern Knights, but I think they now call themselves Derby Super Kings. And they are applying to join the league for next season. They've got one or two hoops to go through, but I'm sure they're so determined they will. And they are looking at the moment to look at Woodville or possibly to reopen some way of playing at Rolls-Royce. Now, whether they'll do that or not, I don't know. Um, but uh, that, in a nutshell, is where I think we're at in terms of rules divisions, um, fixed years, new teams, grounds. And um, as to the season ahead, I'm still waiting for the ECB guidelines to come through. As soon as they do, I'll make sure every club has got them via their captains, secretaries, chairmen, and obviously I'll send them to, to Keith and to Mick Glenn. Dave, thanks. That's good news about all the clubs coming in. I had no idea there were so many coming in this year. It's, uh, I just hope they can keep the teams going when people start going on summer holidays this year. I'm sure they will. Well, I think that, that, that really is a worry that um, clubs have responded to the bounce, if you like, that yeah. people are wanting to play cricket last year and it was causing all sorts of headaches at, at selection that you know you, you probably come up with seven and eight people not getting a game and um, they've got nothing else to do purely and simply well I don't know what's going to happen this year but football could be going on into the summer grassroots football grassroots rugby and holidays will come into the equation but you know we've had to tackle it before and um, I'm sure we will this time maybe we could have on the ground, Dave, eh? Sorry? Maybe they could all help on the ground if they've got spare time. Does that mean work, Steve? Inundated with cricketers demanding to work on the ground, that'd be... Wouldn't it, wouldn't, wouldn't it be almost utopia to think you've got people queuing up to come along? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I could put them on the gang mowers, but when it came to actually push, pushing the rake or doing a bit of hard work, uh, yeah. they don't really understand that has to be done. 
No, no, no. But yeah, I'm being facetious. Sorry about that. No problem. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. We'll move on um, to if, you, if there's no more questions for Dave. Any, any more questions? Right. Yeah, I've introduced Mike uh, Applin. If you want to say any more about yourself, Mike, please do so if I've missed anything out. But over to you for the next uh, few minutes. Right. Uh, thanks very much, Keith. And uh, thanks very much, everyone, uh, for allowing me to uh, spend a few minutes of your time to, this evening. Uh, as Keith quite rightly said, I am, uh, my name is Mike, Mike Kaplan. I am the uh, chairman of the Knox Cricket Groundsman's Association. Uh, I'm also the pitch advisor for Nottinghamshire in cricket. Uh, and for my sins, I also work for the Derbyshire FA and the Nottinghamshire FA as, as a, a support pitch advisor. So my background is very much in supporting grassroots groundsmen, uh, education, and uh, trying to help whichever way that we can. Um, in order to pay the bills on a, on a daily basis, I have a, a sports contracting business called Larch Groundwork Limited. And uh, there's myself and I work alongside a, a guy called Matthew Faulkner, who some of you may know, who repairs some machines and uh, has been associated with the, the Groundsman Association in Derbyshire for a number of uh, years. Um, so what we do as a, as a sports contracting business is offer our services to local sports clubs for all kinds of operations. Uh, but specifically for cricket, uh, we do obviously end of season renovations. That includes uh, tractor mounted scarifying, uh, cleaning up the surface, sealing, fertilising, top dressing. Um, we offer deep spiking to squares with uh, spiking up to the depth of six to eight inches uh, with a Wiedemann vertigray machine. We can vertigray the outfields. Um, uh, we can scarify out ferns and collect the, the risings, top dress, home machine. Um, we also offer servicing services like um, fertilising. And uh, at the moment, we're doing some worm control, which is uh, using a product that Neil Godrich from Darmstadt put me onto called Enhanced C uh, from Vitax in Colville. And that's a product which is similar to those of you who know Purity, which is a, a saffening product, which irritates the worms a little bit in the same way that carbendazine used to do and keeps them from casting on the surface. So basically, um, there's a range of services that we offer to cricket. Um, and you know, if you are in need of our services, then I'm sure that Keith or Steve can provide you with our contact details, or you can look us up on the internet, on the website, uh, and, and we'll be happy to give you a quotation, come along and give you any advice that we can, uh, and uh, hopefully help you improve your squares and outfields. Um, I'm quite happy to take any questions or any inquiries about pricing. Uh, I can only give you some rough estimates because obviously it depends on location and the size of your individual square or outfield that is involved. If I start you off with an end of season renovation, uh, for scarifying, we charge £10 per pitch per pass. So if you've got a 10-pitch square and you want it scarifying in two directions, that would be £20 per pitch, which is 200 quid. So basically, um, you know, that gives you an idea of the pricing for scarification. Uh, if you want the whole thing doing so, scarifying in two directions, uh, the debris collecting, uh, then sealing, fertilising and top dressing. That would turn out around about £50 per pitch. So for a 10-pitch square, you're looking at 500 quid. And that obviously doesn't include any of the materials. So you could supply us with the seed and the loam and the fertiliser, or you could have a quotation from us to supply those products to you. Uh, but that gives you an idea of an end-of-season renovation purely in labour costs what it would be to do a 10 pitch square. Um, we also do a weed spray. So um, Chief mentioned Jason Garlic. So please don't uh, think we're trying to tread on his toes or pinch any of his business, but we also offer that service. So we do weed and feed or weed control and outfields. Uh, a typical cricket outfield, I would think for a, a weed and feed 
will be somewhere between three to four hundred pounds, depending on the size of the outfield. Uh, so we, you know, probably looking at about fifteen thousand square meters, um, uh, which is a typical size of an average outfield for a, a recreational ground. Obviously, you've got bigger outfields, then um, you know the, the price would be a little bit more. Uh, anything smaller than that, you know, we can obviously give you a little bit less, but that gives you an idea again of our, where we are in our pricing structure. Um, in terms of virtual draining outfields, again, it depends on price, but I think typically probably about five or six hundred quid to virtual drain the outfield. Uh, for scarifying, again, a, a similar sort of price, as long as we could tip the spoil, so we collect all the spoil, as long as we could tip that on site somewhere. So. If you want us to take this ball away, it becomes a very much more expensive operation. Uh, but if we can tip the port in this spoil on site, you know, in a corner somewhere, and it rots down eventually, then it makes it cheaper for us. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to ask any questions or any queries about what I've said. Um, please feel free to do so now. Uh, we've all, quite a few of us have had work done by you, Michael. I've been very happy with it. It's a, it's a damn sight easier getting you to do the end of season renovation than uh, going up and down three ways with the uh, stuff off the trailer. But it is, you have to persuade the club chairman that it's in the club's interest, don't you? That's the thing. But, so. Yeah, I quite understand that, Steve. And uh, yeah. it's, not, it's not for everybody, that's for sure. Um, yeah. but, you know, but it does make a big difference, I know. And we, and we would never do it any different. I've, I've spent many a weekend getting six blokes to check all the soil out, bag it up, get ready to load it up, and then it rains. And can you come to I can't come Monday. Can I come Sunday? And, and all that. This way, at least this way, it's done and out the way, and the club knows they've got a, a bill to pay. So, you know, there we go. Anyway, it's not for me to do Yes, I, I can recommend... Um... Recommend Mike. We've had ours done, and as I'm the uh, chairman and the groundsman, I don't have any problems really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Only, only paying this. Only paying for it. Richard. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think. Um, Mike, what's the cost of wiring a ten-pitch square? Well, using the Bitex Enhanced C product, um, it's, it's a bit similar to uh, the, the usage on a fertiliser. So, would you, normally put, would you normally put one or two bags of fertiliser on your square, would you say? Not again. How many bags of fertiliser would you normally put on your square? I wouldn't go by that for all because we don't have a lot of fertiliser, but right, okay. probably four or five. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that you probably need two bags of enhanced C, uh, and it's it, it costs around about forty pounds a bag, and therefore you can either have it supplied and put it on yourself, or if okay. we can put it on, yeah, the cost is going to be to you about one hundred and twenty quid all in with the materials. Um, you know, it sounds a lot, but it's effective for at least sort of two to three months if it's used in the correct conditions. Okay. When's the best time to put it on? Uh, about now. Um, and oh. You really need to get it on before you, before you pre it, really, so you don't roll all those worm casts into the surface and create some areas for, you know, uneven or weeds to get in. So as soon as possible, really. And um, it does need watering in. So if it doesn't rain after the application, uh, you would need to water the square uh, reasonably uh, soon after the application of, of the enhanced C. But hopefully we'll try and time it before some rainfall came, but certainly it would be advantageous if you could water the square after it was applied. Okay, thanks sir, Mike. No problem. Um, just in terms of going back to the end of season, we do find that top dressing is one of the, the areas where people do struggle, you know. If you haven't got a spreader or, you know, you're chucking it on my hand and raking it about, that can be difficult. So, you know, we've got a, a, a spreader that takes one tonne of top, top dressing at a time. So we tip 40 bags into the hopper and dress the square. We can dress, uh, we can put two tons on the square in, in around about half an hour. Um, and it's an even spread as well, you know, it's, uh, it, it's lovely and even. 
we did have a club in Nottinghamshire last year who asked us to put eight tons. I yeah. said eight tons on an eight pitch square. So 40 bags per pitch. Uh, we did it. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I still probably say the customer is always right. Um, I wouldn't do it myself, but we did it. Uh, and it was an interesting uh, operation. It didn't take quite a long time. But yeah, so if you think uh, two or three tons is a lot, you want to try putting eight tons on an eight pitch square. It's quite quite interesting. And the grounds really shows me it has grown. So um, I'll wait and see when I get there next year. But he said it's grown through. So we'll, we'll see when we get back there. Any more questions, lad? Okay. Mike, thank you, Mike. Thank you indeed. Um, what I might do, Mike, is, is send you back a quick email to say, this is what I've written down about your prices. But yeah. If you want to send some notes out about this meeting, make sure you're 100% happy with what I've written down. Okay. Yeah, okay, awesome. thanks. Um, thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, thanks. And uh, over to Steve Hollison, who's going to tell us about um, a couple of things, which is what you should be doing now and for the next uh, six or uh, whatever it is, six, eight weeks to the start of the season. And also a few tips on what you should be doing on your outfield as well. Hi, everybody. Hope you're all well. Uh, just a few bullet points, really. I'm sure you all generally know what to do, but if there's any queries or questions you'd like to ask me after, I'm very welcome to, uh, to answer those. I think the first thing we do when we turn up on a ground, we, we look at the appearance of the square. You know, is the grass stress, a bit of yellow in there, a bit of green? Uh, there's, there's a number of things you can do, but generally to start with, what I tend to do is to actually square my pitches up, you know, get my lines in, uh, you know, get, get it squared off so I know exactly where I'm working at. The other thing is to, is to get all the leaves off, anything that's, you know, generated over the winter, uh, get, get rid of them uh, so you've got a nice clean cut. Generally, before cutting, uh, I would either, and I know there's been a lot of people this year to talk about worms, I've had a lot of problems with worms, and Mick was talking about this enhanced I think it's a good product to use. Uh, but if people haven't had the opportunity to, to put that down, I will, I will talk about swishing your worm cast off if, if the conditions are right. Maybe a drag mat. Uh, I drag mat mine a little bit when the frost were on, to be fair, uh, so it didn't make too much of a mess. I've actually had quite a few uh, worm casts this year. Then what I'd try and do, I'd look at the height of the grass, uh, I'd probably get a rotary mower on it just to start with. Uh, probably take it down to about 20 mil, probably. You know, there are variations on that. When I was with Neil, you know, he, he sometimes went down to 15 to start with. Between 15 and 20, I think that's a decent cut for a rotary. Uh, and, then, and then generally feel and, and look at the square, see what condition it looks at, you know, before, you know, you might start to cross rolling. If, if the square looks a bit yellowish, you know, I'm about to put some fertiliser on my square. It'll probably be a 9, 4, 10, spring and summer. Uh, that's what I'll be using. I will get my grass down to probably 20, 18 mil. Uh, and then what I'll try and do then is, is, is feel, actually feel the square, you know, see if it's not too wet, not too dry. Uh, and, and then I'll probably start my cross-rolling sessions. When people say, how long do you cross roll? Well, a lot of club groundsmen sometimes are limited with time. I've got two squares. I've got 18 pitches at Corndon. And I would probably spend uh, at least eight hours per square. You know, that's the sort of time I'd be looking at with a four foot auto roller. I would cross roll it. Uh, and obviously look at what's happening when you're rolling it, you know. Make sure you're not making a mess. If, if, if the roller's got water on it, it's too wet, really. So generally, we've had some decent weather this week, you know, and probably next week. So uh, I know some clubs might think it's a bit early, but if you can get a lot of this work done early season, it, it will benefit your club. Uh, People, some people say, well, how about giving to light scarify to get rid of some of the rubbish off the square? Yes, you could do. Uh, generally, what I do, 
and, and, and I'm not God, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, I shall mark two or three pitches out on my square, and I shall actually scarify the pitches that I'm going to I'm going to work on uh, with a light uh, push push scarifier. Uh, generally, it, you know, sometimes a square it, it gives you an indication what it's like. It, it you know, you, you can see if a square it is stressed a bit really over the winter, and uh, some clubs have, have not spiked. Some clubs have spiked, you know. Some clubs, I've been to a couple of clubs already and there's a bit of moss there. And really that's because of lying water and lack of aeration, really. We, we do stress spiking if you can. And all you guys, Mick, and, you know, you, you'll all understand why we do that, uh, just to let the square breathe a little bit. But generally, you know, the, the looking of the square, you know, that, that, was, that tells you a picture. If you've got any areas where the end of season renovations not quite worked, when I was at Derby with Neil, he had no hesitation in trying to repair early, you know, and then you can always put a few uh, grow sheets on top of the patches that may not have come through. Don't be afraid to do that as early as middle of March or something like that, because the grass will take. And some people are going to have a lot of worm casts where, where we get big clusters of, you know, of soil. Them's the sort of areas that really you want to be, you know, sticking some grass seed in, you know, when the temperatures rise. I mean, it's 16 yeah. degrees today, uh, you know, so in the next week or so, you know, it may be ideal to get cracking on it. Uh, at fields, there again, uh, I'm doing a bit of work at Belper this year. Uh, along with another guy, and, and we drag Mac the old uh, outfield today. You know, we've we've sort of like harrowed it, drag mapped it. You know, it's actually been striped, uh, not dead light, but what we've done, we've we've tried to get a bit of the rubbish out, ready for cutting, probably next week uh, or the week after. Some clubs will be later, you know, but the weather, the the weather's a big indicator of of when you can get on your square and when you can't. If the weather's right, guys, I would encourage you to get on it. Uh, you know how our weather can change. 16 degrees in February today, it might be minus four in two weeks' time, we don't know. So any opportunity that you can get, and I know there's a lot of groundsmen who are, you know, who are volunteers. It's not easy, but the, the more you can do. Uh, up. I've had a few questions about red thread again. Uh, you know, in my opinion, it, it, it will go out. It's lack of nitrogen. Once the weather warms up a little bit and it gets a bit drier, you know, there again, the drag mat in the swishing, the brushing, you know, that'll all help to, to, uh, to alleviate it. So uh, the outfields, don't be afraid to work on the outfields. You know, mix there in terms of some clubs that, you know, I've played in the county league for 40 years. And we've got many, many grounds that's so different, you know, aeration and spiking and deep, deep spiking and uh, verta draining. Very important if you can afford it. Uh, there again, Mike again and Jason Garlic, they do spray these out fields to get uh, a selective weed on it. And, and it, it does make a difference to the looks of an outfield if you can afford three or four hundred quid. I know it's a lot of money to some clubs. If you've not got the money where you won't be doing it, but it does make a big difference. I mean, over the last two years, we've struggled at Gordon, uh, but, but this year I'm hoping to have it done because it makes a massive difference to the appearance. Uh, you know, when you've got your pitches sorted out, you know my beliefs on, on, on getting pitches ready. If you've got a decent covering system, you know, you try and start preparing pitches probably between seven and 10 days before the game, if you can. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, my club and I know Belper are even itching now to get playing on grass. So I should be looking to try and get both teams out by probably the end of March. I think it's 29th of March we can get cracking, I think so. And we've had no training through the winter either. So as groundsmen, you know, try and do your best for them uh, to try and get them on grass if you can. Uh, 
But, uh, you know, basically, you know, if there's any questions, I think that's uh, a rough idea of what I'll be doing, you know, in the next two or three weeks. Uh, some clubs might think March is early. I always believe in the weather and the temperature. That's a big thing for me. When I worked at first class at Derby, I always used to start in March and uh, we started the process then. You'll get knocked back sometimes. The weather might, you know, kick in the teeth, but, you know, our weather changes. So make the most of the weather that you can do. Um, that's about it, really. If, if anybody's got any questions or, you know, we're here to help. There's a lot of people here tonight to help. You know, Mick from Knott's, me uh, and other groundsmen, we're here to help you. And, and that's the key, you know, to what these... Uh, meetings are about whether whether we have a meeting on ground this year i'm not sure we'll be able to do that but if we do you know i don't know what the regulations are but if we can have a get together we'll try uh you know and do a bit of practical work i think i think that's important for the you know for the guys who who work at grounds the other thing is you know are your machines okay have they been serviced? Have they been shot? Have they been looked after? You know, try and get onto them early. Just to let people know what I do, I go up to my club once every two, three weeks in the winter. You know, I start my machines, uh, might put a bit of, uh, you know, oil on the blades, etc. things like that. Uh, check the engine, check the batteries and things like that. The worst thing that can happen is you turn up at your ground next Monday morning and nothing works, you know, so... There again, you know, Matt Faulkner again. He's there if anybody uh, wants any yeah. emergency help. Uh, you want me to say, Steve? Steve, <laughs> we've, Steve, we've got a question from Dave Fern at Wellington. Is it too late to spike now? And then I'll come to Ed. Uh, I, I wouldn't spike now uh, if it was me. Uh, I suppose you might be able to get away with a thin pencil time spikes, but... I think really, if, if the damage is probably done now, if, if you've got a bit of, you know, moss or red thread or stuff like that, really it wants to, in, when you've done your end of season renovations, you know, probably leave it for two months and then probably do November, December, January, probably. You might, if the, if the soil's soft, you probably get away with it. But the idea of uh, end of season spiking, it is for the next April and March when you, you're preparing your pitches, really. Uh, uh, me personally, no, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I wouldn't do it. So, yeah. what, what do you use a sour roller now, Steve? Uh, I, think, I think I generally, once I've caught me square with the rotary, I'll get it down to 15, 20 mil, something like that. And then I'll actually start, you know, after I've cross-rolled, you know, I might give the square a light scarification. You know, you do get bits and bobs in the grass. It does bring it up a little bit. Uh, Serral roll, there again, if you've got some bare areas of, you know, that just wants topping up, you, you can use a serral roller, seed and, uh, and top dress. Don't, don't be afraid to top dress. I mean, when I was working at Derby, Neil... I'd like a little two-week window. And, and, and he re-venerated some of his pitches, he did, Neil did. You know, and I says to him one day, I says, bloody hell, Neil, what about the players when they come back? He says, well, they can bloody dance around it, can't they? You know, he, he was a big believer in trying to get his pitches back, Neil was, uh, within the season. But some, some groundsmen do it, some groundsmen don't. Some groundsmen wait to the end of the season. You know, I have different ways. I only have seven playing pitches at Bournemouth. So I generally outplay four pitches and then that's it with them. You know, other people move from week to week. When I was at Derby, I was preparing pitches for four-day games. You know, so I used to think, well, why waste? Why waste the pitch if it's playing well? You know, why not have two or three games on it and then practice on it after that, then put it to bed? A lot of people don't like players pl training on the square. Well, sometimes I think it's important for players to train on a square, not a brand new pitch or anything like that. But it, sometimes there's no reason why they can't practice on the square after you've played on a pitch two or three times. 
And I'll tell you what, the players like it. You know, it's encouraging for them. Steve, we've got another. If anybody else, if anybody's got questions, you can either put them in the chat or, or use the reaction bar to raise your hand. Uh, I've got Ed Barker from Wharton. Ed? Yes, thank you. Cheers, Steve. It's good to see you again. Hi, mate. Uh, You're right. Yes, thank you. He came up to Wharton and he got me using pitches till they were worn out and he made a fantastic job. I managed to air eight last year. What I wanted to know from everybody else, at the last meeting we were talking about um, slow-release fertiliser from Talbot Turf. Yeah. We went out and saw some. I went and fetched a couple of bags. I put mine on. It certainly looks green. It looks healthy. Did anybody else try it? Because we only learn from what everybody else has done, you know. Yeah, I think I think a lot of groundwork. I mean, I've been a groundsman for about 30 years and we never know everything. I used to work with a guy called Walter Goodyear. And, uh, you know, sometimes you get, you know, it's like Mick, you know, he, he set up company, he's doing his bit. You've got Jason Garley. You've got Rigby Taylor. Uh, you know, I've used different substances. And uh, you, if you look at your square, you'll know if it's healthy. You know what I mean? It, you, you can see it. It faces you straight away. You, you can say, God, that, that looks okay, that does. You know. Uh, so which one did you use? Ah. Was it the enhanced one? It was the it was the, the slow release one that Talbot Turf uh, went and sourced following right. our last meeting. Right, um, I, I think I remember. And and there are many products on the on the market, you know. And I used to know a guy; he wouldn't use anything else but what he'd been using for years, you know. And you know, there's all sorts of different stuff coming out at the moment. And you know, me and Neil, you know, we see each other quite regularly. And when I was at Derby. Neil used to use this or that or whatever it was. You know, grass seeds are a little bit different, but, you know, Talbot, t is it good results then? Is it? Yes, I, I yeah. think it's worked. You know, I mean, it, yeah. it's about three times as dear as buying the short term fertilizer. Right, right. But I mean, I used to farm and in the winter you'd put the muck on and, you yeah. know, it'd take all that time to come out for the next spring. So it's the same principle. What I would do if you found that very successful. I'd, uh, I'd send Keith a little email when you find out what it was. And, and it, you know, it's just sharing, isn't it? Yeah, right. I'm, I know I know what it is. I'll find out because I've got in my notes from the last meeting. And I'll yeah. When I finish. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I haven't used it because we've all still got loads and loads of the old 468 and 1239 in our store. So, but, but when they're finished, we're going to switch to the slow release stuff and try that. I think, I think over the winter, what, it sounds to me like the one that Talbot Turf are using is the slow release one. It's to cover a number of months, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that, that's the key where you get, you know, I bought some from Rigby Taylor a couple of years ago and my square looked awful, you know, on, on the background. And I got some stuff from Talbot to, uh, from Rigby Taylor and by gum, it shot up like you wouldn't believe it. But I tell you what, cutting it, 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 it was growing quicker than a, than a monkey in a zoo, you know what I mean? It was, it was unbelievable. And uh, slow release, it's like, you know, they always say, you know, not too much, but often, do you know what I mean? And uh, there's a big truth in that. And slow release, it can be very successful and it sounds like it has been for you. Yeah. Steve, I've got... Um, yeah, go on, I've got one. Mick, like, go on, carry on, carry on, Mick. Now, I was going to ask you a question, Keith, but you can ask it yourself and then I'll come back to you, Alan. Right. Okay. Well, as, uh, first of all, Romano, what's what's the time span for, for eight hours of rolling? Are you doing that on one day, two days, one week? What? If, if weather permitting, you know, uh, you really need to be rolling as slow as possible. And what I would do to start with, if my ends are not quite like I want them to be, I would probably start me rolling from five foot to five foot across ways, if you can understand that five foot away from the end creek. I mean, I, I overuse my pitches, uh, as I've told you guys before, and sometimes I have to top up my end. So I probably wouldn't roll them. So I'd actually roll the surface we're actually going to play on. And then uh, if, if the ends are not too good, I, I'll probably touch them up and then leave them for a bit and then do the cross rolling on the ends later. Uh, but generally the cross rolling, if, you know, as slow as possible. I tend to 
uh, go up and down, up and down, just off cross my roller. So I would say that's eight hours. Might it might be two days, you know? So it might be even three days. But I think if you make a note, uh, I'm a big believer in writing things down. Which pitch, you know, are we going to play on the first game of the season? You know, every year mine is one, three, and the training pitch on the end. You know, that they're, they're the pitches I concentrate on. If I need any titivation on the rest of the square, I'll do that, you know, while I'm getting the other pitches ready. I might even do some repair work on the ends, or, and I'll be doing that while I'm working on those three pitches on both squares. So generally, I'll try and have six pitches ready, more or less, at the beginning of the season. Steve, we've got a couple more rolling questions, questions. Yeah. while you're on about rolling. rolling. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Mick Sharp, is it is it too early to start rolling tomorrow? And Bob Marsden from Buxton is asking about, does the pace of rolling make a difference? I, I think the pace of rolling does make a difference, Steve, but I'm not an expert on grounds. It, it's, it's a combination of, of a lot of things, Mick. Uh, uh, rolling can make a pitch or it can break it. The timing of rolling is very important. Uh, I mean, I have been to see Bob's ground. Uh, I, I think testing it, you know, seeing how damp the pitch is or, you know, if it's really dry, I think, I think at times it's irrelevant to roll. Uh, you've got to have that little bit of moisture in there, but not too wet. And I, I think I've said to all, I think I've been to about 38 clubs, and I've always said, be careful when you're rolling. The timing is very important. However, is your roller, you know, an auto roller, a uh, four foot wide, fully ballast, is two and a half ton. I know there's a lot of clubs out there, you know, probably got rollers of about a ton. Basically, I wouldn't heavy roll to start with. I would, I would, uh, I would do the cross rolling with a with a roller that wasn't fully laden. Uh, which, you know, that's what I do at Corn. That's what I did at Derby. Uh, yeah. We've got you know, a... Sorry, we've got a half hundred weight uh, walking roller, you know, sort of, you know, to break us in. That's... With your, to start with, that's a good way to yeah. start. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, as long as you've got a couple of donkeys to... Yeah, good luck with that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I think what we've got to understand is we all sit here. I mean, there's 25 of us, I think. We're all different. You know, and and my the thing that I enjoy about this is meeting people who have different obstacles. It might be cash, it might be machinery, it might be time. And I think the key to this is a, a lot of if we, I'm sure you've all got the, you know, the right ideas, but we're having to do it a little bit different sometimes because of equipment, time, and, and finance. So, you know. The other thing about going back to the, the, the Groundsman's Association, don't be afraid to ask. That, that's the key that we're trying to put out there. You know, we, we're trying to help. I, I don't mind answering phone calls all day, to be fair, because I love cricket. But, you know, a, anything that we can do, talk to us. We're there to help you. Steve, well, just the speed, the speed of rolling. How yes. fast can you go across your square? That's Bob Martin's well, question. The the, uh, the the slower the better. If you've got an auto roller, uh, you know the, the, the accelerator on the left hand side is very slow. You we know, have to do something never before. You want to say, Steve? <laughs> was that your radio on? Me? Yeah. Yes, I was just turning it off. <laughs> I mean, slow. You know, I, I was at Derby once, and I always tell this story about. Keith Loring telling me off and he come to the middle of the square when Neil got married and he was on holiday and Keith Loring came up to me and he says, I'm telling Neil of you, you're rolling that square too slow. And uh, he says, I want you to speed up. And this was a football telling a cricketer how to roll the square. And uh, there was a few jest words like off was the last one. Uh, slow, you know, it is, if you've got a four foot roller when you're rolling a pitch, I'm not talking about cross rolling now. If you're rolling a pitch, you know, it, it'll probably take you about, you know, 30 minutes really to roll a pitch at like first class level. If you've got a 10 foot wide 
uh, pitch, which we do, we will go across that pitch wave three times. And you would do that twice as slow as you could, you know. And, and for me, that first one or two rolls is very, very important to get the base of a good pitch. And then obviously then you've got to keep it dry after that. But cross rolling, you might be able to go a tad. I mean, I can't put miles per hour down on it, but but very slow. You know, if you imagine twenty-two yard pitch, and uh, you're going to go across the pitch three times, twice, because that's what you do. You do it twice. If you know, you work that out at twenty-five minutes, half an hour, and uh, and then I would leave that. Then I would clear off. I'm going to do something else and then come back in three hours, four hours' time and roll it again, exactly the same. Steve, so the pros- I, I think, yeah. Bob, Bob have you, you, are you desperate to get back and ask another rolling question? I'm sure you are. Well, no, no, it's just, I, I mean, I, 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 I hang on every, all of Steve's words and uh, people who roll at Buxton realise they've got to go very slowly. The only, the only problem I have is that, um, you know, other experts are not convinced that going very slowly makes that much difference, but... I um I just throw that it's a bit like you know people will say you know um it, it's trying to understand what is best I certainly think what is best for your own square is the important thing isn't I think it? That, you know there again you know I, I think the first one or two to me is always important uh, and and there again we talk about time don't we we talk about you know how much time people have got on squares etc I'm actually going to the if you like, extreme, where, you know, I've actually prepared first, you know, pitches for international cricket. So if if it means that, you know, you, you have to go a tad quicker, well, you know, the thing about it is be even with it. Whatever you do, be even, because that's what you're going to play on when you finish preparation on your pitches. OK, Steve, I've got... Alan, do you, you've got a question. Do you want to... Yes, it's, it's, it's with regard to uh, solar release uh, fertiliser. <clears throat> I went over to, uh, to Talbot Turf this morning to buy a bag. They haven't got any. And the problem, the problem that Talbot Turf's got is that unless people order it prior to going over, she can't get it. If, if you can order something like 10 tonnes, then that's no problem. If you yeah. want to go over and buy one or two bags, you can't do it. So mm. I finished up buying the proprietary stuff, which got some, some iron in. One question I want to ask Steve is, is moss. Yeah. I think this winter we've had more moss than we've ever had. Because our square is full of it. Is it? Yeah. Ours is as well. And my question that I put on here for Steve to answer was using about using iron sulfate. When would you use it? Even if you've not got moss, got moss, would you use it on your grass as well? Well, moss is always with iron. Moss is always a big problem, you know. And usually the moss is caused because of the winter, you know, yeah. like, probably lack of aeration. Uh, are more pre- prevention than cure if you can. Uh, you know, probably Mick Applin. Mick, what 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 do you use, Mick, over there for moss? Um, in the past, uh, I've known people even use lawn sun. Yeah, on yeah. Uh, there are people saying, "Well, you shouldn't put sand on a cream square." Well, the sand itself is very minimal, and there's sand in the surface anyway. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't be against uh, occasionally using lawn sand to get rid of yeah. it, which is basically. Personal plate with a bit of yeah. it. Um, and what I tend to find though is that once the square starts to dry out in, in, in spring, the moss doesn't like it. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's off, yeah. It disappears. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you can, as you're scarifying your pitches out, yeah. scarify the moss out with it. Yeah. If you are worried about it, then ferrous sulfate is, is the product <coughs> to use. Um, but be careful when you're scarifying uh, the dead moss out because you don't want to be disturbing the surface. Yeah. I'm, I mean, the other, the other thing is, uh, you know, where is your moss? Uh, is it on a length? Is it on the ends? Is it to the, towards the bottom end of the square? Uh, I went to a club yesterday 
and 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 all their moss was you know at one end of the square where you, where you could see what had happened the water had run down collected uh you know and I, it's for, it, it was nearly just off the square so i would i would scarify that you know try and get it out you might have to top dress neil at derby he, he used to top dresses a little bit and he he used to uh, scrape it out and uh you know he'd put a bit of seed in there and he'd re he'd re loam it you know but uh Iron, you know, yeah. Uh, don't be afraid to use a scarify a little bit, depending, you know, if it's not all on your square owl, I know what I'd do if 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 there's certain pictures that you've got that you look well, they look okay. I'd use them first and then yeah. you might you might have to do a bit of work on the on the on the moss. Don't do what Lufford did and we kill the square and uh <laughs> Steve, I've got I've got Simon from Cromford with you, Andrew. Yeah. Simon, you're on mute, Simon. You're, you're still on mute. Yeah, is that okay? That's Sorry, it, I'm just good. saying. I'm just saying. I've got to go. My, my dad's fallen over, so I've got to disappear. So. Sorry, well, Alan, but yeah, yeah well. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for everything, and I'll I'll join the next meeting. Okay, thanks a lot. Cheers, mate. Bye -bye. Um, all the best to you, Dad. Yeah, thanks a lot. Any more questions for Steve? I think I think just as a follow up, Mick, if there's no more questions, uh, if anything does crop up and and you do seem to have an issue. You know, don't, don't be afraid to, uh, to to give us a bell. You know, I, I think the Groundsman Association, I think we're getting stronger. I, I think, uh, you know, things are going quite well. We're here to help you. Uh, you know, and really, I think that's the best thing we can say. You know, we give advice. You know, the, there's always difference of opinion sometimes. But I think everybody on the course tonight, you know, we've got an ECB pitch advisor from Knott's. There's me. You can be in cricket all your life and there's still things that we don't quite sometimes grasp. But, you know, as I say, the, the, the foundation now is very good. The association is good. There's a lot of good people about. So please don't be afraid to ring us. We're not here to dictate to you. Honestly, we're here to help you. And, you know, that, that's, that's my final word, really, Mick. Uh, Mike's got his uh, his hand up. Mike, I was just going to say about slow release fertilizer. Um, our depot is based at uh, Ticknell in Derby, and I've got about twenty bags in stock uh, of the slow release, which would be five for cricket. If anybody wants to come down and pick one up, uh, you're quite welcome to do that. Its price is a uh, twenty five pound a bag, so. Uh, you know, if, I don't know what that compares to Talbot Turf. I've no idea what they charge. That sounds a lot, yeah, sounds a lot cheaper, that does. Yeah. Than what they quoted. So what, what is that for, Mike? Do you know? Sorry? What is that for? Yeah, when, you, when you say slow release, what is it? Yeah, it's you know. slow release MPK values look a bit yeah. weird. There's, there's a lot more, not, you know, a lot yeah, more no. it's like 20, I think this is 20, 10, 10 or something. Something like that. I'll tend to, so it's a, it's a summer fertilizer. And it's a it's a, a four month release. Yeah. So you know it, 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 it's um, it's spring summer, uh, but it's a slower it's slow release over four months, so sixteen weeks basically. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so if anyone wants to give me a ring, uh, you can put my number out on the uh, on the contact details. Uh, pop them down to Ticknell and pick a mag up. Try it, you know, and if it works for you, then all the money all well and good. Uh, but I've got about 20 bags at the moment in, in the shed, so quite happy to, you know, anybody can come and pick one of those up. Uh, Keith, there was one thing that, that I picked up on that I, I have asked, been asked a couple of times about this, this, this um, issue with worm um, suppressant. So I, I don't know if that's something, I, I heard in there, was it Vitax or something that was mentioned? Well, we talked hands, about this yeah. on the last. We talked about this on the last call, if you remember, with Julian yeah. Morris, and he spent probably fifteen minutes talking. Well, ten to fifteen minutes talking specifically about the two two things you can do for worm suppression. Yeah, he's, and he's, so he, he mentioned both Vitax and uh, this and the. Oh, 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I enhance the, the yeah. two things. Okay. Uh, well, it's still, some people keep telling me that it's still a problem. I perhaps ought to try and get the message out a bit firmer. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it, it, it is a problem. It will always be a problem. Worms, and it's just basically, yes, getting the message out and pointing to the video. It's on the, the, the question and answer sessions on the, at length with Julian Morris last time. Yeah. If you go to Melbourne, you want a gun, not a worm killer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any more questions for Steve? No questions. So, thanks all for your time. Um, obviously, we would normally have a sort of get together for bacon butties and the like, but from what I think, we can't meet until I think it is something like the 12th of May. So, we can't, the April date is for six people. The next one is for the pub's opening in the 12th of May, and on the 21st of June, it's free to do whatever you like, supposedly, is the way I read the government's time scale timetable the other day. What I suggest we do is we try and convince Albert to, to host us for a social of some sort, Steve, maybe July time or something like that. Yeah, I think, I think over, sorry, Steve, over the years, uh, you know, Neil, Neil's been really good uh, down at Derby. Uh, and with the foundation being based down, you know, I know Neil very well, so I know Mick does. You know, if we can do something like we did, I think it was three years ago, I think we had a really good, we went on the square and we went in the net area, et cetera. You know, and I, I thought that went down really well. Uh, yeah, very good. And I, and I think, you know, I know we, we, we like to look at our own game, but it's always nice to see the next level. And, uh, you know, I know Neil's been a, you know, he's a big mate of mine and he's been really good to the association. Uh, it might be worth it. I mean, if we can't get that, we've got plenty of grounds that we can go to, if we can go to, do you know what I mean? Uh, so probably Steve and Keith, Mick might be able to get together and we could even go to Trent Bridge. Is Berkshire still there, Mick? Yeah, uh, uh, I spoke with the, uh, because now the Notts Cricket Board has uh, been disbanded and the, the Notts County Cricket Club is, is responsible for recreational cricket in Nottingham. And so I spoke to the, uh, the new um, chairman uh, the other day and he's keen that Steve uh, opens his doors to the recreational game. So I'm hopeful that we can get a, you know, uh, an open day down there where we can go and have a look at the square yeah, you know, like I say, go and have a fit Steve's uh, tool shed and, and maybe a, a little bit of what he does down there. And, you know, we'll open that up to the Derbyshire lads as well as the Knox lads. And, well, it's and it's always a big thing to, as an ECB pitch advisor, you'll know this, mate, that, you know, we go around the country. When we used to have meetings, we used to go to different grounds. And it's always nice to see different situations and different levels of cricket. I went to Worcester that year. I don't know if you went. It was when they had the floods. I know they have the floods nearly every year, but <laughs> we we went uh, directly before Derbyshire. We we're going to play Worcestershire in about two, three weeks after our meeting, and you won't believe the state of the ground. You know, as you know, local groundsmen, we'd have been pulling our hair out. And the Worcestershire guy, he took us out to the square, and it looked like a bloody bomb site. There was timber on it. There was shit out the river. There was all sorts. And he said, ah, save me fertilising use that will. You know, and he dragged Mac to it off and uh, there was playing. And it, it happens quite regularly for him, but for us to see it, it was unbelievable. So sharing, I think, I think that's a big thing. You know, the more we share, the more we learn, in my opinion. Yeah, it'd be nice to see a test work, it wouldn't it, at Trambridge? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I was lucky enough to play at Trambridge and... It's a fantastic place to play. That's not to say Derbysh is not, because, you know, Derbysh is a good... It's not a test ground, but if, if you look at the record at Derbysh on pitches, I think you'll find that Neil Neil's right up there in terms of international ladies and the England Lions, and, you know, uh, he, he's, he's won a few trophies at, uh, you know, Groundsman of the Year, etc. so... I think we're lucky that we've got two close together. Yeah, no, so. 
Okay, we'll try and do that then. Thanks, thanks for that idea, uh, Steve. We'll try and fix something up for Derbyshire. Maybe Stratford as well. Any more questions? Any more? Anything else anybody would like on the on the future call? I mean, we obviously tried to do um, spring maintenance. Now we did what you can do over the winter last time. I guess the next one is to do end of season work. But well, we'll see how we go with that one. Anything else anybody wants on there um, in, in the next meeting? I think Keith Hughes. He was on about doing some uh, video work, being as you, you, you're keen on your videos. Uh, you know, if we can get one or two of them out, maybe, you know, just seeing us do a bit of donkey work or, you know, what I call the horrible work, you know, messy work. Uh, and then we might even do one on a finalised pitch, you know, what it should look like, etc. And, you know, see if we can do that. Well, the idea was to get you on your roller, Steve, to show everybody how fast or slow you go. That was uh, what, uh, the point during the pre-season one, if you could do. Well, he, he goes, you, he goes you very, very slowly. <laughs> You'll have to have plenty of film. Yeah. <laughs> he says he hardly moves. Yeah. That's what I tell well, people at Buxton. Well, I, I can assure you it's it's very slow. <laughs> Keith is after an Oscar, you know that. He wants you to <laughs> no, no, don't buy into it. All righty. Be good, that. Yeah. Any any Please. final remarks, Steve, you want to make? Then we'll, we'll close. No, thank no, you. I think... Oh, oh sorry. Both Steve. Both Steve. Both Steve. Either, both the chairman. Chairman first. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks for everybody being on here. I'm sorry I kept nipping off. I forgot to put my uh, dinner in the oven. <laughs> Not doing very well. Uh, thanks to Steve for his advice. And uh, thanks to the league chairman for telling us how difficult it's going to be if... Uh, our third team can't have a pitch next year to find one because uh, it's getting a bigger problem. I think councils are going to end up having to make pitches on council on park somehow to, to, to get all these people who don't want to work on the wickets. They all want a wicket to play on, but they don't want to do any work on it, do they? So it's quite an interesting concept that I find. Uh, it's very good. and I wish everybody the best for the season and even better when we can open the bar fully and uh, make a bit of money to pay for uh, end of season renovation uh, next year. So we can afford to have Mick Applin come and do our wicket again. After <laughs> you come to Sunday, Acre. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Keep